And so let's get started to our Community Voices Advancing Community Policy Agendas through Community Campus Engagement. So within SUFFICE, we understand community campus engagement um, to include community-based research, teaching practices like community service or community-engaged learning, as well as a variety of other practices um, which link together communities and post-secondary institutions. And the common denominator across all those practices is the need to build strong relationships based on mutually beneficial goals between post-secondary institutions and, its, and their external partners. And our focus specifically with the Suffice Project has been upon the not-for-profit sector and those organisations there. So for today's presentation, we have four wonderfully distinguished uh, community <laughs> presenters. So Kathy Bright will be, um, and Diana Bronson are both joining us online today. And then in addition to that, we've got Bonnie Brayton here and then Colleen Christopherson Cote. So let's begin uh, with Kathy to start with. So for the past 13 years, Kathy Wright has been a key catalyst in the poverty reduction efforts in St. John, New Brunswick. Prior to moving into semi-retirement, she uh, served as the executive director of Living SJ, Living um, St. John, a network of leaders from business, government, non-for-profits and low-income neighbourhoods focused on ending intergenerational poverty. And as both a professional and a volunteer, Cathy has contributed to changing social issues at local, provincial and even national levels. And her work is guided by the necessity of a diverse set of partners working and learning together. Cathy is a recipient of the 2017 Vibrant Communities Canada Legacy Award and also the Canada Volunteer Award. Um, and next we have joining us online, Diana Bronson. So Diana Bronson, has joined Food Secure Canada as their ED, Executive Director, in 2012. And she's worked to really strengthen the organisation as a national voice of the Canadian food security movement. Diana's trained as a political scientist and sociologist, and has got a professional background in journalism and international human rights. And Diana's research, policy and advocacy work are centred on supporting social movements across the world. She's participated in many international negotiations on human rights, climate change, biodiversity, technology and sustainable development over the past 20 years or so. She's even worked as a senior um, person here on the Hill in, um, in Ottawa from 2006 to 2008. Bonnie Brayton, who's uh, here in person, has been the National Executive Director of Disabled Women's Network of Canada, or DAWN, since 2007 when she established a national head office in Montreal. And this national cross-disability feminist organisation has focused on advancing the rights of women with disabilities and deaf women in Canada internationally for over 30 years. And through DAWN, Bonnie helps highlight key issues and advocate for policy changes for women with disabilities in the employment sector right through to the justice sector. And Bonnie is also the president of Clean Sweepers an innovative social economy organisation providing home care services to people with disabilities and seniors as well in her Montreal community. So Colleen christopherson Cote, welcome <laughs> Colleen, is the coordinator for the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership and the community co-lead for the evaluation and analysis working group of Suffice. She lives and works in Saskatoon, Treaty 6 Territory and the homeland of the Métis and the interconnections between um, her work or amongst her work sites provides her with the opportunity to really catalyze, convene and coordinate community-based work to drive change and build capacity around improving the lives of vulnerable people in Saskatoon. So we're just thrilled to have you here today. Thank you very much for joining us. So I'm gonna turn it over online to Kathy right now to get us started. Kathy, hi. Is she, oh, Kathy might be frozen. So if she is, what we're going to do is move on to Diana. Diana, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, hi Diana. So do you mind if you, do you mind if you started us off? No worries. Great. I'll just, uh,
set up, or well, somebody will advise me, Amanda will advise me when my, my time is getting short. Yes, they will. So, yes, they will. Well, we were, we were asked to answer three questions. So you haven't introduced those questions, David. Shall I do that? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, so the first question is, what is wrong with the current policy prescriptions in your particular area, or in my area being uh, food security, food sovereignty, uh, the, the host of issues that are related to food policy? And then um, the second question is how our practice and how our community campus engagement has been used by us to impact policy, and finally, at what, what uh, level of, of government our, our policy is directed at. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, it's kind of fun to prepare this and to reflect upon the many, many ways in which our collaboration with Suffice over the past uh, five, six years has enabled us to, um, to do policy. And we're perhaps a little bit unique in that regard because our goal um, is really to influence policy and to build the capacity of community organizations to engage in policy processes that may be available. Um, so historically, um, Food Secure Canada has been very involved in campaigning about the lack of any food policy in Canada, about uh, the vacuum uh, that existed uh, in recent years, the lack of coordination um, amongst different government departments and amongst different initiatives in the market or in the nonprofit sector. Uh, we led a massive engagement exercise called the People's Food Policy that you may be familiar with. And during the 2015 election campaign, we ran a campaign called Eat, Think, Vote, where we um, invited our member organizations um, in whatever domain they would be, in farming, in public health, in uh, in food banks to invite the candidates for, uh, who are running for election uh, into their community to share a meal with them and to uh, debate policy. And we put forward some very, very precise policy requests at that time. And the biggest one was the creation of a national food policy. That was the overarching campaign. So. Um, during that campaign, we actually used uh, many of our academic collaborators, I shouldn't say used, but they provided services to the campaign by writing up um, background materials, uh, by fact-checking for us, by providing bibliographies of up-to-date research, by reviewing our campaign proposals and making sure that we weren't saying something that was a little bit off. Um, and lo and behold, in 2015, in the mandate letter that was given to Lawrence McCauley, the Minister of Agriculture, there was an instruction to create a national food policy. So after years and years of uh, our main thing is we need a national food policy, uh, our, our goal was now to sort of put forward some of the um, primary uh, areas of concern and demands that civil society organizations had regarding that food policy. Um, so that was challenging because there are real uh, interests at stake and the locus of the discussion was the Department of Agriculture, which is not the one that has been historically most open to uh, the civil society and where industry has pretty much a stranglehold on the policy development process. So there's very little um, that um, would be helpful. Uh, to Food Secure Canada, for example, our defense of small and medium-sized farmers, our push towards more local, sustainable, and organic agriculture, uh, action uh, on the income front to, con to, to address the growing problem of food insecurity, the need for a healthy school food program, all of those things were pretty absent. So um, we worked with our partners, which are our members, including many researchers and academics across the country, to insist that this be more than a Department of Agriculture process. We got that. We won that. Um, and before we knew it, there were 16 government departments sitting around the food policy table. Well, you can imagine how that did not expedite things. It kind of made the process rather heavy. So in fact, the government took 18 months to come up with a consultation strategy that lasted three months. 
and they are now taking six months to summarize the input that they got in those, uh, in those months. But uh, I want to bring it back to the question of community academic collaboration and what we were able to do in, that, in, those, um, in those months. Uh, first of all, through a MITAX program in collaboration with uh, some key researchers and suffice Peter Andre and Charles Levko and others, we were able to um, hire someone who has been our virtual policy coordinator director over the past several months and who has a postdoc, uh, who, who has a doctorate and is therefore very well equipped to edit, refine, review, engage, everything that needed to be done. So that's Amanda Wilson, who is in the room with you, uh, with you today. And that is really, uh, Amanda, in a way, uh, is, um, is the person most identified with suffice in our office and amongst our board. Um, but I think the, the, uh, the products and the processes that she and others have helped to generate reach far beyond uh, the suffice project. Um, I did want to underline what a challenge it is for most community organizations, and I'd include Food Secure Canada in that, to actually carve out the time to do the detailed policy work um, that needs to be done. So what we've found over the years is that we, we tend to call it a campaign in the box in, in our internal way, in our internal discussion because we want to make it easy for people to engage, to organize an event, to reach out to their MP or to their uh, candidates for office, to reach out to their local officials. So it's really this sort of idea of a campaign in the box, and that will require not a thesis on the complex causes and realities of food security, but a two-page briefing note, really clear demands, nice short sentences, a few key infographics, and then we've got something that people can actually campaign on. Um, I, I do think that we have had, I think it's, it's demonstrable, the impact that we've had on the food policy debate uh, from getting it into the mandate letter in the first place and then helping uh, the government to put in place a process that would involve all the relevant departments. So everybody from Indigenous and Northern Affairs to ESDC to obviously Health Canada, the Public Health Agency. Um, and there's a number of others that I, that I won't uh, go into. Um, we were able to generate, with Amanda's uh, help and stewardship, a discussion paper to frame the issues that the government ended up putting on their website as one of the key documents. We were also able to work with others uh, in the room, uh, Peter Andre, but a number of other academics, such as, uh, as Rod McRae and Evan Fraser, on a major governance proposal. So this is kind of a, maybe of interest to others on the call, but we figure that it's one thing to have a food policy that is declared and, um, you know, written up and announced and put on a shelf and forgotten about. And it's quite another thing to maintain the engagement of the government and of all the different stakeholders in trying to build a more democratic, accountable, transparent policymaking process. So we pulled together, uh, with the help of our research partners, a multi-stakeholder working group on uh, the issue of governance of national food policy and what would be the ongoing mechanism to ensure the policy's implementation, to tackle issues as they come up, um, and to provide an ongoing forum for dialogue. And, um, it was very interesting because we were able to come to agreement on a research product that then generated a consensus um, proposal to government, which was for the creation of a National Food Policy Council. And again, I could go into more detail, but I don't want to get um, too lost in the weeds there. But I don't think that partnership would have been possible without the academic um, um, facilitators, interveners, researchers, writers to help pull it together. On a number of the Thank other proposals that, Diana, that oh, turn down my team. It's too loud? Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Right. It's right. Oh, OK. It's still OK? I'd, I'd be happy to um, run around to some of the things and make it some of the things at the end of the end of the end. 
Um, do um, we have? We have. Okay. Okay. So. So. I think, think we have a bit <laughs> And so um, Bonnie is going to speak uh, a little more about her work with uh, Dawn for us. Um, but I'm going to find um, a little, we're going to do things a little differently, a little more interactively <laughs> with Dawn. So, um, did you want to just uh, introduce yourself again, just to remind people? And then, Sure. Um, so I'm the National Executive Director of Dawn Canada. And as you mentioned at the front end, I established our national head office in Montreal in 2007. Dawn Canada has been around for a long time, but I think it was an important step in establishing Dawn as having a national head office and an executive director, sort of the beginning of really being able to establish a frame around the work that Dawn had been doing in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, you describe um, this project as more than a footnote, and so I'll get you to explain that in just a minute, but it's something you're calling a new uh, platform for policy reform, um, mm -hmm. Bonnie, and Obviously, um, uh, the Suffice project itself has been, um, through Dawn, focused on disability. So what was the problem, you know, that you had identified with current policies and practices that led you to a focus on disability policy? Well, I was going to say, you know, Dawn Canada's uh, active mission is to address the issues uh, women with disabilities and deaf women in Canada face. And more than a footnote is a platform we now have to, I think, deliver really on, a, on a, a very meaningful way. I think a lot of the learnings that came out of the, the um, project that we did through the Violence Against Women's Suffice Hub. And again, if I can take us back in time, uh, when we started on this project, and again, we were a little late joining the, the, the hub, but when we did join, it was because I had run into the person, Diana Majuri, who's leading our hub, and had shared some research with her that really surprised her mm -hmm. as somebody who, of course, has a strong background in the issues of women with women and violence and the law. Um, so it was in sharing sort of anecdotally in a conversation with her that she invited us into this hub. At the time, I think also noteworthy is that we were under the conservative government. Mm -hmm. And that um, while Don Canada was doing work and research and had just completed um, something we had done in the 13 provinces and territories, which was a very much a community-based project where we were trying to connect with women with disabilities and service providers in their communities. So again, some very strong community-based research that informed us that there was a bigger issue that women with disabilities were asking us to address, which was the system issue. Mm -hmm. And that's the policy gap, and that's the program gap, and that's the service gap, of course. And so by the time we came around to being at the Suffice Hub, we had identified the issue and we had begun to look also for other opportunities to begin to address these system issues. And again, um, coming back to getting involved with the Hub, it was that there was research that we were coming across done by mainstream researchers that either had really some good design questions but hadn't pulled out the data or conversely had focused on violence against women and left the issue of disability off the table as a lens. And, you know, today there's lots and lots of talk about intersectionality as an approach, but of course people who use the term intersectionality don't always fully understand its meaning and don't apply that disability lens. And of course that's led to some really significant gaps in knowledge around who are women who are experiencing violence and by adding the lens of disability, what we're trying, I think, to say to the larger research community is it is not about violence against women with disabilities. It's about violence against women writ large. And adding the disability lens is going to lead to, to a deeper understanding of gaps in your knowledge mm -hmm. around who it is that you need to be focused on when you're doing your research. I think a strong example from uh, memory that, again, I think is quite striking was that there was a qualitative research study being done in 2014 with sex workers in Canada, in British Columbia, 3,500 sex workers, so fairly deep in terms of qualitative research, excellent questions, and when the researchers pulled back up the data, one of the things that I saw, because I was looking for it, I had added the disability lens, was that 35% of those sex workers said that they had a long-term disability before they became sex workers. That's really significant. That's more than one third of the cohort. Yeah. But the researchers didn't identify it as a priority or pull it out. So that, you know, like I said, is really the genesis of why 
we felt it was important. And so over the course of doing um, this work, which again has been primarily a literature review, um, pulling out some case studies and really beginning to unpack feminist disability research as a framework for the larger VAW violence against women sector in terms of work has been sort of the, the background purpose to that. Added to that has been a project on Canada has been funded for under status through Status Women Canada called Legislation, Policy and Service Responses mm -hmm. to Violence Against Women with Disabilities in Canada, which is uh, a study we did in Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia with an interest in Ontario because of the uh, AODA, so that, again, in, in an Ontario context, we had 10 years of disability legislation. And, you know, you... Just remind us, AODA is... The Ontarians with Disabilities Act. I don't remember yeah. what the A at the front is for, but it's okay. essentially the <laughs> provincial legislation in yeah. Ontario. Yeah. Um, and again, Canada today is about to introduce federal accessibility legislation, where, again, this work that Don does becomes an important backdrop to really looking at whether or not legislation is in any way going to be impactful, or if we really have to look more closely, I think, at policy, policy reform, which again, you know, hopefully will lead to a, a better response in terms of service and a better understanding of who are women who experience violence. So you're really uh, working across those levels of, of policy, if you like, of local, regional, provincial, and then even, from, do you say, federal? Or yeah, federal, I think. Is that where you targeted? Like, do you have a, a strategy around where you want to achieve? Uh, well, I was going to say, I think something interesting from the federal level is that two years ago, I was, in, I was appointed to the federal minister's gender-based violence uh, council mm -hmm. through that appointment, which, again, is built off of Don's profile being raised by the Suffice Project, by other things that have been positioning us, again, with the new government in terms of our expertise, where we now have access to policy, we have access to the research, and we have access to influencing program at the federal level, where conversely what I would say is, because we're a national organization, we've been really challenged in working with the provincial and territorial governments around policy and policy reform, where, again, we're not considered to be actors in the context of provincial and territorial a policy, okay. despite the fact that women with disabilities are so underrepresented as to not have peer support groups or representation at the provincial, territorial, even the municipal level. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and so your sort of the work of of partnering with academic researchers mm -hmm. um, with a sort of a community-driven approach has meant that you've brought, or that combination in some senses, that produced that new lens that you're speaking about? Well, yes. Out of, out of all of this, like I said, in terms of a sort of a convergence of Don's work um, being supported, being highlighted at the federal level, and again through the hub, is that we've developed this platform called More Than a Footnote, which of course is a very explicit pointing to the fact that what we did find through our research and what we've seen through the work we've done through the hub is that women with disabilities as a, a cohort and the disability lens has been footnoted. It has been footnoted to the point where women with disabilities have been ungendered in policy or, you know, grouped in with as people with disabilities or simply par parceled off as a vulnerable population as opposed to there being active policy development around women with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And like I said, even in terms of the understanding of who, who those women are. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. We're getting timed. <laughs> All right, yeah. I, could, I could keep going in that one, but we, we have to move on. Kathy, I think it's... Oh, have we got Kathy now? We do. Yeah. Does it sound like... All right. I, I'm in the... Kathy. I'm in somebody else's office, so if you see someone walk in the door, it's a person I've never met, um, but anyhow. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, thank you for having me here. You can hear me okay? Great, Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so we all know that partners are very key to um, creating both a momentum and informing policy. And for us, it's poverty reduction. So the University of New Brunswick St. John campus has supported its staff, its students, its faculty, and the vice president's office to be involved in poverty reduction efforts in our community. And so what I want to do is just quickly highlight three ways that they're contributing. Uh, one is they're part of a larger momentum for building poverty reduction policies and uh, strategies in our community. So being part of that large community momentum is key. The second one is, is that 
They provided research and data collection to inform public policies. And then the third one is that they've actually focused their efforts on one of our priority areas, which is in the area of education. Um, all, those, all those key ingredients contribute to moving policies forward. So just thinking about the, the big, larger momentum piece, um, so Living SJ, which is the group that I'm talking about, um, the, uh, we have a long-standing collaborative relationships in our community with the university, um, with the business community, with neighborhoods, with nonprofits, philanthropic funders, and government. So that's, that's a real strength for us. Um, our roots of poverty reduction became, started to become more strategic uh, when we became involved with Vibrant Communities Canada and became a trail builder in 2004. And that really led us to, to actually get started on a specific strategy. By about 2012, a group of partners started to really be concerned that we needed to raise the attention to the issue and the profile. And so that's when we, we explored collective impact as an approach. Um, and so uh, with the university, actually they were part of this, uh, they shared a meeting where we brought community leaders together, pitched the idea of, you know, poverty is complex, the solutions are complex, and what we want to do is take the five components of collective impact and move it forward. The first being a community engagement process to come up with a common agenda. So we've come up with a common agenda. That's four priorities. It's revitalizing our low-income neighborhoods. It's um, closing the education achievement gap cradle to career. It's um, really having wellness centers located in the community with individuals at the center. And then the fourth one is related to employment and providing the, the training and support so that individuals are ready, confident, and connected to employers. Um, so Living SJ is overseen by a leadership team of which the university is part of it. And then 15 months into this renewed strategy, with Suffice Money, we were able to hire an evaluator to assess how are we doing in those components of collective impact, and then what are some recommendations to look at how do we, how do we increase the progress or the impact on our priority areas. So St. John is kind of a perfect mini city uh, for a living lab on poverty reduction. We're small, 70,000 people. Our issues are 20% poverty, 20, 30% child poverty, and it's really generational poverty in our community. As I said earlier, we've got long-standing multi-sectoral partnerships. Um, we have a reputation for being unique in the province with, you know, a group, the Business Community Energy Poverty Initiative, new initiatives related to pregnant and parenting teams, employment and training programs, micro-lending, you know, the list goes on. Um, and so all of this, plus some groundwork, really contributed to us um, being able to uh, receive a fund, um, a social innovation fund from the province of New Brunswick for $10 million over five years to try to address poverty in a different way. So we're really a living lab trying to move forward and, and, and demonstrate through actions and results to policymakers that there are more effective ways and use of resources to move policies forward. Um, and to hopefully, our goal of course is to really impact generational poverty. So that's the community momentum piece. The, looking at the, um, the, con the contribution of the university to our, uh, one of our priority areas of education, looking at research. So the university and the community college work with our business and education uh, partners and um, conducted some research on differential funding uh, policies across the country to really present a case for changing that policy in New Brunswick. And that's where all schools regardless of the needs of the children, are all receiving the same amount of money. And, and you know that that doesn't work for children coming out of low-income neighborhoods. Um, so that has um, uh, contributed to being in included in the 10-year uh, province's education plan, a commitment to look at differential funding. But it's also uh, facilitated an increased momentum in our community to try to move more on that issue. The second area is action in neighborhoods. And so the university, as the vice president's office, has involved students mentoring um, children in, in a middle, uh, elementary and middle school in two low-income neighborhoods, um, and then following those children as they move into high school and mentoring them there. 
So the results have been increased uh, literacy scores in the elementary and middle school. 100% um, to date high school success of, of uh, high school graduation rates. Um, and so uh, it's also through suffice uh, research that we found that um, it's changed the attitudes of parents um, and, and in terms of viewing that post-secondary education is within their reach. And that really coincides with a recent policy of the provincial government for free tuition based on your income. Because if you don't have um, children and parents and low incomes with the confidence that they can do it, you're not going to use that policy. And then the last thing about that um, is, is that the research uh, showed that there was a real different attitude towards students, uh, towards the issue of individuals and families living in poverty. Um, their, the university's work in this area on the ground has added to the momentum to push uh, better services for at-risk students. So it continues to, to push the need for policy change in how we're delivering those programs. So in summary, um, you know, the campus community collaborative efforts uh, are, are contributing to um, laying the foundations for policy change, uh, pushing the community momentum to, to rally for the needed policy changes, as well as changing the attitudes on the ground of uh, youth and families. Um, and we also have, uh, stay tuned, more initiatives in the works with the university. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, for that. And it sounds like, you know, Living SGA has already created the conditions over time for a substantial provincial uh, investment and policy uh, change. And also, you're very much involved in the enactment of that policy. And so, uh, and to the extent that that's connected in with some uh, support from the universities that were post-secondary sector, that's, that's a wonderful example. So thank you for sharing that. So we do, I'm going to... I was just going to say... I, I will... Sorry, I was just going to say that the thing, um, the point about the fund is that the community decides how the money is being spent. So I just wanted to add that point. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. So, Colleen, <laughs> Colleen christopherson Cote, thank you very much for being here. I think, um, obviously, Colleen's from Saskatoon. She similarly does... Um, uh, poverty reduction work, specifically from a reconciliation framework, though. And so, um, obviously, uh, there's many Canadians uh, today who's who've still somewhat in shock and whose hearts are heavy uh, because of the news out of the Battlefords mm -hmm. and, uh, and your part of the world on the weekend. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that just highlights um, the significance, I think, mm -hmm. of your work. So, yeah, okay. so if you could share with us what you do, how it's how partnering with the post-secondary sector um, <laughs> enables you to achieve the types of shifts in, in policy and practices that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks. Um, so I'll start by saying what a privilege it is to be here on the unceded Algonquin territory, visiting from Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis within Saskatchewan. I live in Saskatoon proper. Um, and so I agreed to do this talk, I don't know, a handful of months ago. and as I was prepping for it and then arrived here yesterday, it is with a bit of a heavy heart, and so I am slightly emotional about it. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, reconciliation work and all the work that we've sort of been working through over the course of the last handful of years um, is for naught. It just means that we pull together the allies and we work stronger and we build more um, solid groundwork to move the work forward. Um, so there was a ton of support on the weekend in Saskatoon and across the province with rallies uh, and um, vigils and thousands and thousands and thousands of people came out to show their support for what was going on in our province. And I think it speaks to the positive nature of the work and the idea that there are a lot of non-Indigenous people who feel the injustice uh, and that want to move the work forward and do something different moving forward. So. Um, so the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership in 2016 made a decision to uh, include um, a new pillar within its theory of change. I'm going to call Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership the SPRP because it's too much. and I only have eight minutes and I'll spend all my time saying the name of my organization. Um, so we have a, a core pillar within our work and our theory of change around nothing about us without us, the inclusion of people with lived experience. Uh, and in that pillar, we had Indigenous representation, but we made a conscious decision 
um, that we needed to have a pillar around um, we are all treaty people, we're all on a path of reconciliation. Uh, and we're learning a truth and reframing a truth um, that's rooted in poverty reduction in our work. And so that new pillar has opened up a new conversation. Um, there is a large movement within Saskatoon and in the province uh, organized by the Office of the Treaty Commissioner called Reconciliation Saskatoon, of which I'm a member. There's about 75 now partners at that table. It's an amazing group of people who come together, universities at the table, um, a lot of post-secondary at the table. Um, but what we're trying to do is reframe the way we look at policy and practice from a, a decolonized, non-colonized perspective. Um, and in hopes that we create this sort of ethical space that lies between my non-Indigenous traditional Canadian colonizer perspective and an Indigenous world. Um, so there's this safe space where we overlap uh, and we come together in this and create this ethical space where we can have a conversation around what does it look like. Um, many of the Indigenous leaders that I work with talk openly uh, about having to navigate two sets of worlds. They navigate their Indigenous world and then they're forced to navigate a non-Indigenous world as well. I, as a non-Indigenous leader, never navigate an Indigenous world. And so the call is for me to start opening my heart and my mind to doing that kind of thing. And what happens when we meet halfway or when we meet in an overlap space that's uh, built on trust and relationship, um, we start looking at the way our policies are built and um, how they perpetuate cycles. So. I had originally responded to the questions in writing, and I'm not much to read my notes, but I know there's a there is a bunch of there's a ton of data around overrepresentation of Indigenous people in systems within the human service system. So, an overrepresentation of children in the foster care system, an overrepresentation of Indigenous men predominantly, but also women in the justice system. 24% um, of the kids living in Sa in Saskatchewan live in poverty. Of that 24%, the vast majority of them are Indigenous. And so there is, a, there is a call and a necessity and a fiduciary obligation to, uh, to change the way the systems are built. And so we're trying to look at, you know, what does that look like? Um, and then how do, we, how do we sort of work together in a, in a good way to bring policy and change and to essentially eliminate poverty in Saskatoon? And that's our, our mission. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you could speak to something like Station... Um, yeah. as a vehicle through which that collaboration, and I'm sure that mm -hmm. you have others, not just at the University of Saskatchewan, but that's an example of yeah. how you've partnered together to yeah. further that work. So Station 20 West is a co-located space within the core neighbourhood of Saskatoon, which is the predominant space where vulnerable people live, uh, and also predominantly um, Indigenous, although there's a larger or growing population of newcomers, um, partially because the rents in that space are... Um, quote, affordable, which they're actually not, but in the grand scheme of the affordability of Saskatoon, they're more affordable. Uh, and so Station 20 West was created so that there could be sort of a one-stop space for people to access service. Uh, and so currently there's um, meeting space where I can use or any, any community partners can use, but uh, the health region is there, Kids First, which is a home-based um, program for children, for vulnerable children, zero to three. Um, there's a public library and some housing attached to the space, but the office, uh, the university has a community engagement outreach office in the space. And so I think originally it was intended to be a bit of a link back to campus, but has evolved into more of a brokering role. Mm -hmm. And so um, Lisa Erickson, who's the outreach engagement office manager, I don't know if that's her actual term, but um, she does this remarkable thing of brokering relationship between clients in the building, service providers in the building, community people and community organizations like myself. I'm completely mobile without, like I don't have an office space, but I'm often there. And so she's brokering relationships between poverty reduction, um, health, justice, work, employment, economy, those kind of pieces. So how is that sort of collaboration then? Where, where are you aiming sort of, I mean, you have a, a large brief in a way. There's a lot of policy and practice change mm -hmm. that you're seeking. But where do you sort of make decisions around where am I going to focus that right now and how do your allies help you with that from the post-secondary side? Yeah, so, well, Lisa, the university right now is the um, co-chair of the, the Poverty Reduction Partnership. So we have a fairly extensive connection right now to campus. Um, 
we changed our focus from a provincial focus. We had originally called on the provincial government to create a poverty reduction strategy. We're the last province, although BC might be arguably last. I don't know, there's some hoopla there, but <laughs> uh, we, we theoretically were the last province to have a poverty reduction strategy from a provincial perspective. We pitched the economic argument around what our current government spends on keeping people in poverty, which is $3.8 billion annually, um, and said basically you could make a handful of changes and drop that number in half. Um, we, we've had some changeover in government from a provincial perspective, um, and we had a huge austerity budget, which was debilitating to many of many vulnerable people in our province. And so when that happened, we changed our focus to municipal. And so now right, um, the Poverty Reduction Partnership is working on a poverty elimination plan for the geographic space that is Saskatoon. Uh, and the evaluation, monitoring, and analysis that's going into the building of that strategy framework um, is heavily influenced by our relationships with practitioners and, and faculty um, attached to the university. Terrific. Thank you very Thanks. much, Colleen. And uh, thank you, Bonnie. And thank you, Kathy and Diana. So we've got some time now for some questions. And Nicole, should we take online questions first, if there's any there? There's none in the chat box right now. And so mm -hmm. I'll open it up to um, participants in the room if they'd have any questions of our um, you know, any of our four speakers there around their work or something that interests you? Check, check. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Peter Andre. I teach here at uh, Carleton in political science. Thank you all for your presentations. And I wonder if any of you could speak to whether you find that relationships with academia help you access funding for the kind of work that you're doing? Is, is, it, is it useful for uh, gaining funding or, or gaining credibility? Do you lose credibility with certain groups? Maybe you could take it in that direction as well. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer that first. Um, and I would say it's really clear for Don Canada that that's been really critical, in fact, in terms of the fact is, is that we've done some important community research uh, that was largely in, ignored by policy people and by government. And um, it felt quite important to us, for example, to be part of the, the research hub here in terms of the Suffice Project. We also work with several other researchers who, again, are community university researchers, the kind of folks that work in universities that value community research. And I think that's an important distinguish, distinction to make is that if you're going to talk about working with university researchers, they have to be a certain ilk, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be the right folks. Because I have certainly turned down research projects with universities as well, where mm -hmm. it was clear we were research subjects as opposed to participating actively in the research. But I think it's really clear that when you have that mutual respect around the research model that, that really works for community-based and uh, community -based research, that you end up with extraordinary results. Uh, one that I would cite in terms of a past example is a shirk called Femme North Net that was here in Ottawa based with the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women that worked with university of a number of different university researchers from across the country. Um, indigenous women and women with disabilities. And, you know, really, like, I would say that it was one of the most extraordinary examples of intersectional research that I've seen in Canada. So, absolutely. So, uh, anyone else, Diana, um, Kathy, or Colleen, to add to that? Well, yeah, I think Diana? That there's more research money out there than there is community money, just to be frank. And the budgets are much more generous. <laughs> Um, we uh, tend to partner on uh, grants more in, a, not, not as researchers ourselves, but more in the knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization sphere. Um, and I think um, we have a lot to offer in that regard. And I think a lot of community groups as well do. I think there's a tendency these days for bigger research projects to create a logo and create a brand and build a database. and do all the things that, in fact, many of them exist in the community sector. And if we were better organized, we could perhaps offer as those, those services. Um, but I think the, um, 
from what I know about funding as a nonprofit, I would say not as a charity, but as a nonprofit. Uh, so we're restricted from a lot of charitable funds because we do advocacy. There's just way more money available in research than there is in general for us. And so those partnerships are very valuable. It would be nice to see some of those rules loosened up. It would be nice to be able to go in as co-applicants. It would be nice to um, be able to build bigger budgets and have some of that um, outreach and, and, and knowledge mobilization work that are recognized within the, within the grant proposal. Because with a few exceptions, and they're very important exceptions, and suffice as one, the, the actual dollars flowing our way are very small. Thank you for that. And I think this is an important question, so I'm going to ask the both of you if, 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 um, if you find that it's helped you access further funding through partnering with post-secondary uh, institutions or researchers. Kathy's talking. Uh, Kathy's speaking, but we can't quite hear her, so I don't know. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> just uncoordinated here. Um, uh, is it okay? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, just to, yes. Yeah, okay. Just to say that um, from a community momentum perspective, having the university at the table, the the credibility is very important. Um, and then there, the idea of um, some of the access of money that it has available for research has been useful for us. And um, some ideas that we've got percolating in for the future, um, having the university involved is, is also very important. So definitely uh, credibility for sure. Great. For me, I, th I would say that the bulk of the funding, per se, that I access around university relationships is more in-kind. Um, I find that they support the office. So the office at Station 20 West supports me um, with space and printing and all of those pieces. Uh, hospitality, things that I can't get funding for, they often are supplying me access to those things. Uh, and then the clout piece, right? So when we apply for something large, although I don't do a ton of grant writing, mostly my work is funded by my partners, um, but there's a clout that comes from having um, academic partners on those lists of partners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do we have further questions from, from the floor? or? Question that comes in with our email. Okay. Can, um, we're going to have a question read out from uh, an email. So Lori says, how can we engage people who may not otherwise be interested in the things we're advocating for? And she had an extended question of, how can we mobilize knowledge when interacting with people of opposing views who are determined for their perspective to succeed? Yeah, so does anyone Welcome want to, to speak life. to any part of that? Welcome to my life. <laughs> Sounds like Colleen's got something to say on it. <laughs> yeah, I have to get my head around it before I say something that may not be appropriate. I don't know. Um, you know, we talk a lot about target audience when we're talking about poverty reduction, and we talk a lot about laggards and, you know, that sort of bell chart of the early adopters and laggards. Um, quite often we just don't go there because the energy that we need to expend to try and change minds is just not, it, we just can't. So we spend the bulk of our time talking and um, engaging people who are either um, late majority or early majority folks um, as far as that sort of adoption bell curve goes. Uh, I'm going to be faced with that moving forward in the next handful of months around reconciliation and the work that we're doing and around trying to block um, a large portion of the population who may or who does not share the same views that I share. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how to change views other than to continuously produce the truth and talk specific truths uh, and to perpetuate those, that language. Um, yeah, I don't know. We, ad we adopted um, as our strategic plan sort of officially last year and it's been sort of percolating over the years. I've been the executive director of DOM, four pillars, which is research, education, policy, and advocacy. And it's clear that whichever audience you have, if you have those four things in place, 
you know, over time, sometimes you win them over, but if you don't win them over, at the very least, you, you, you feel comforted in the fact that you put the facts in front of them, and if they don't do the right thing, that you gave them ample opportunity to do so. And I do think, like I said, what I will say about the luxury of being women and girls with, with disabilities organization is so little has been done that almost anybody that I challenge or tap will have to concede they haven't done it. Uh, a good example from this fall was a very large symposium on women in STEM in Montreal that was announced on a feminist blog and I saw it, I looked at the agenda and I, I know what I'm looking for and I went through the whole thing and it was really clear women with disabilities were completely off the table even though this was about women and science and research on women in science. And so the person who posted it was the diversity officer <laughs> from, from um, the federal government agency that was sponsoring it. And I contacted her and initially she was very resistant and then I did what I do sometimes which was shared a few pieces of science with her and, and really turned it around on her and made the point, it's like you're a scientist and you're denying science because you don't know what that science is. And I think it's really important sometimes to challenge those people, especially the, the people who really think they are above and beyond what you have to tell them because they know more, they're the holders of the knowledge. And, and often, like I said, it is in giving them something back that is relevant to them that you get at them and sometimes it is just like you said though, it, it's, you just got to walk away. I can think of uh, many, um, well, a number of people who work in the universities in various equity offices or disability offices who would probably agree with everything that you just said. You know. mm -hmm. So, um, does anyone else want to respond? Looks like looks like Kathy does. Uh, did should we take the question now, Nicole, or should we listen? Kathy was uh, almost jumping out of the screen there to say something, so I feel like we should. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't uh, jumping out of the screen. The, the fellow who owns this office came in. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they've given me five more minutes, so um, I said only five minutes. I, I was just going to make I was just going to make the point that um, I think uh, what you what the first speaker I'm sorry I don't remember your name said is that this is all our work all the time coming up against people who, who, um, whose vision or views are different. But I think that's where the more people that share um, the same, uh, that are involved in your initiative. And I was going to say, never do it by yourself, because that's really the key is you're not the only speaker. And, and for us, even having um, a group called the Business Community Anti-Poverty Initiative, when they go out and speak to then their colleagues, it's business to business making those points about the issue of poverty. So I think it's really having an army of, of people who agree, who are ready to move forward with you. So that was just the other one thought I was going to add. Thank you, Kathy. So a question from online. So we have uh, one final question, and okay. we'll have to keep the answers short. Right. Um, it's from Charles. He says, in today's political climate, many academics and community voices that take a critical perspective are ignored and or charged as irrelevant. In your opinions, how can academics attempting to do critical or social change work have more or better impact on communities and community organizations? So, Diana, do you want to start um, there? I, I can offer a thought on that. Um, <laughs> I, I guess it's it's in making the information accessible. I'd take the example of uh, the proof project on food insecurity run out of by by Dr. Val Parasek. They have you know, they do very complex work on levels of household food security and they are able to translate that into infographics and pie charts that are extremely compelling and easy for us to um, retweet or uh, write up, uh, make it accessible, I think is, is the most important thing, just because we're so stretched for time, we probably don't have time to read the academic paper unless we literally have to do a presentation on it. That, that, that would be my, uh, my advice. It's not more research we need, okay. it's more time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I sometimes go to um, using, uh, you know, again, outside research is often the way that I'm able to push better rather than citing Don's own research. And 
you know, the World Health Organization said in 2010 that the largest minority group in the world today are women and girls with disabilities. That's the World Health Organization saying something really important in 2010, and we're in 2017, and we still struggle with people understanding how big, how important, and how critical it is that we not leave, you know, essentially what is one quarter of the population of women in, in the world out of policy discussions, out of every discussion that needs to be had at every level in terms of community because women with disabilities have been invisibilized, but it's not because they're not there, it's simply because the research, the science and so on hasn't yet reached enough people for them to understand that they are leaving, like I said, one quarter of all women in the planet away from the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who knows? Kathy, want to go? Uh, uh, yes, I, I was sorry. I was thinking that um, there's so much wealth uh, going on in the research at the university that I find it very um, there's not very many opportunities where that research and the findings are shared with the community. So I, I think there's there's certainly room for a, a stronger relationship between the work that the universities are doing because they all affect us in the community and they're invaluable. Um, and I think. Um, the, the point made earlier that um, people feel sometimes that you know uh, a, an executive summary is a book. <laughs> so trying to keep information short and concise uh, and the language is also really important. But I think we just need to have um, more sharing between what uh, what are the what are research projects going on and what are the results back to the community. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy, and we have to leave it there. So thank you to everyone for your participation today in this Suffice webinar and how partnered research and learning activities between post-secondary institutions and community-based organizations can indeed lead to social change and policy movement despite the obstacles. And so thank you very much. We'll have some more details for you about each of these um, community-based organizations on um, our website and please uh, tell your friends about the Suffice webinar series. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> yeah. All right.